You know, good evening and welcome to the virtual long walk. My name is John Estridge. I'm the president and founder of Estridge and Company, a mortgage broker and capital advisory firm based in New York City. I'm also a proud member of Trinity College 1975. I'm pleased to be joined by two fellow alumni in the industry, K Casey Tischer, 01, and Tom Safran, 67. Casey will lead a discussion with Tom about Tom's career in real estate development and affordable housing. Casey has nearly two decades of experience in real estate investment and development. In 2013, he co-founded Freehold Capital Management, FCM, a real estate investment and development firm headquartered in Boston. Since its inception, FCM has established offices in eight states and is currently developing approximately 15,000 residential units and 1 million square feet of retail and office space via its Freehold Communities brand. FCM also has 2,500 single family built for rent units under construction or in lease up under its 360 communities affiliate. In addition to his professional accomplishments, Casey has been a dedicated volunteer for our, our alma mater since graduating in 2001. He served on the reunion, re reunion committees and just completed a second term on the board of fellows. And now for Tom. Tom Safran, 67, has led Tom Safran and Associates for over 40 years, developing affordable housing for families and seniors in the Los Angeles area. More than a traditional development company, TSA provides many services for its residents, including educational and creative programs, referrals to social agencies, and even financial assistance for students. His company has received numerous awards over the years, including the 2014 Preservation Award from the Los Angeles Conservancy and a 2015 Business Advancements Award from the California Council of Gerontology. In 2016, Tom was inducted into the Housing Hall of Fame of the California Housing Consortium for his efforts to create affordable housing throughout the state. A psychology major, Trinity, he also holds an MBA from UCLA. Before starting his company in 1974, he spent five years in various positions with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. In addition to his many commitments and professional accomplishments, he has also given richly to our alma mater. For years, he led the Trinity alumni community in Los Angeles and graciously hosted numerous events at his home. In 2017, Tom was the recipient of the Engelbrot Cup, one of the greatest honors that can be bestowed on a Trinity alumnus. In addition, I Googled Tom's company and you know, the great thing about Google, you can find out about everything and anything about somebody, especially their company. And I turned to um, his employee reviews, Tom. And I will say after reading about a dozen of them, I've never seen such glowing remarks and things came up. Awesome, great environment. Everyone is friend, friendly, great mem, uh, mentorship, a great workplace environment. The only criticism, only criticism I saw was you might be overworked, Tom. And if that's the only thing, you've put together a fantastic company. And uh, now, before I turn it over to Casey, I think Tom would like to uh, talk to us and show us some slides. Tom? A company credo that we developed about five years into my company. And if you see it on the screen there, future generations will remember us by what we do and not by what we say. So I want to show you what we've done. And let's go to the next slide. Um, when I started at HUD, I was in graduate school, University of Chicago in urban studies. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I was trying to figure it out, but I was very interested in that field. This is what affordable housing and public housing look like. This project is uh, four miles from my house in West LA. It's the only project in a less impacted area of the city of Los Angeles. Next slide. Pruitt Igo is a famous complex in St. Louis. It was built in 56 and it was torn down 20 years ago. The next slide. So I'm in graduate school in the University of Chicago and I spent a month rotating at this complex. 
these are pictures I was able to find on site, but it was a series of high rise buildings in south side of Chicago. That's what public housing looked like. That's what many people in the country thought of for affordable housing. So I'm in graduate school two years out of Trinity in 69, and I get a summer job at HUD. It was actually a year's internship. And I decided I liked working at HUD better than going to graduate school. So I stayed at HUD. And after I finished the internship, I became a multifamily housing rep for Los Angeles. Uh, excuse me, that was later for Iowa and Nebraska. And I came out to LA for a wedding in 69. I liked it better than Chicago. And I arranged for HUD to move me. And then I became a multifamily housing rep for LA County. And I ended up working at HUD for five years and left in the spring of 74. And that I left on a Friday and on a Monday, next slide, I was a consultant to the city of Santa Ana in Orange County, about 40 miles south, 50 miles south of the city of LA. And they paid me $2,500 to be a consultant for this project that they were considering uh, to work with the developer on and they wanted advice on how to help the developer. And I gave them the advice, they followed it, it and they, the project got built. I had that point started an MBA at UCLA and I turned my presentation to the city into independent study, real estate finance, got an A, and 22 years later, I bought this building. So that is quite a, a story for me, and I wanted you to see that. So when I was at HUD, next slide, I fought developers over the, con the projects they built. They weren't building particularly attractive buildings. Better than the first slides you saw, but this is the first, one of the first projects I did on my own, and it's outside LA in a more suburban community in Ventura County. And we got a national award for this project, one of the only one they gave for senior housing in 1969, 79, excuse me, during the Carter administration. Next slide. This is 1980 was when I built my first family. This is affordable, low income, same income level as public housing for families. I, up until that point, the first six, five years, I didn't feel comfortable doing family housing. And now we do family and senior housing, the whole gamut. Next slide. This is a project for which is in the San Fernando Valley, 241 units. And it was one of the first projects I did with the federal tax credits. The Section 8 program was essentially killed by Reagan in 81 when he became president. And the tax credit program came in in 86. And we got funding for this in 89 and finished it in 91. And we got from the urban, next slide, we got an award of excellence from the Urban Land Institute, which is a terrific organization of real estate developer and associated type people. Next slide. This project in the heart of Hollywood, one block from Sunset and Vine, uh, I intended to buy these buildings and tear it down and build a five-story building. But people in the community fought me because they wanted me to save these bungalow courtyards from the early 1900s. It became the first rehab project I did. And the result is we do lots of rehab down and, and it's easier than building new construction for a variety of reasons. Take a look at the next few slides. The next one, look what it looked like before we bought it. It was the center of gangs, both drug and, uh, and uh, gang members for the heart of Hollywood. It was the heart of crime. The year before I bought this property, it, there were two murders in the property and the police wouldn't set foot on it. Next slide. And the next one and the next. And you see what it looked like when we were all done. Uh, 
I'm delighted that I saved it, but right, you know, within a block, they're building high rises of this building. But knowing when to fold is very important as a developer, meaning, you know, how many battles do you want to fight? How big a fight? I have a property on the beach in Venice, just south of Santa Monica, that took 25 years to build. I never want to repeat that. So I've learned my lesson and I'm happy I ended up rehabbing this complex rather than building new. Next one. This is the first pro one of the first projects I built with retail. I was on a bike trip in Italy in the Venice area and I went into a solo northeast of Venice and I loved the town, took pictures of it and told the architect to make it look like an Italian village and there it is. Next one. This is in the edge of downtown, a very low density. At the time I bought this land, this area was in a major crime area just west of downtown. And I bought the land for $10 a foot and hence, which is incredibly low. And hence uh, we built a two, three story building over parking. Next one. This is the first project I built in the South Central area. The council person for this area saw the project you just saw, Skyline Village, and said, I want you to come to my district and build a project. This one also has ground floor retail and it's at 33rd and South Central Avenue. Next one. In 2008, we bought eight buildings totaling 812 units and we rehabbed all eight of them. And because of the experience in Hollywood, I decided to, I was very comfortable rehabbing buildings. So here's what it looked like on the left and how we changed it on the right. There was no real identity, no entrance to this building. And so I now build clocks at the entrance of every building and usually with a flagpole. Next one, that's the back of the community building. Next, this is a project out in El Monte. Look at on the left what it looked like when we bought and the right after. I love landscaping. Next, look at the community room. This is the norm of the buildings I bought. They just had folding chairs and tables and uh, cheap linoleum and wondered why or stated that nobody ever uses the community room. Now they do, big time. Next. This is a great one. The Inglewood Meadows project a few back, the mayor came to the opening, loved what we did and said, I want you to buy the building across the street that was managed poorly by the owners. He facilitated by buying the building and rehabbing it. Next one, that's the community room before and after. Next. I'm in the heart of Carson across from City Hall. There was no there there. The city was incorporated in the 60s and we helped create it there. After we built this complex of affordable and market rate housing, once in a while we do market rate. And in this case, I thought this site was too good not to do it. And the city helped facilitate it with funding to make it more feasible. And as a result of this project, in all the surrounding directions, they're now building market rate housing. So we really helped to revitalize this city. Next. The council person for this area, this is in West Los Angeles. This is the first time I did a significant percentage of homeless housing. This project, uh, the neighbors fought and helped reduce the size. It was approved by the city council for 155 units. The neighborhood council approved 178 units and I kept reducing it to accommodate the lawsuits that we often get in California. But 25% of this building was formerly homeless. Next. As a result of the project we did in South Central, we bought this project from the city and this was if you saw the movie, The Green Book, this was the first black hotel built in the early 20s in Los Angeles. And it was accommodations 
a lot of famous from Ella Fitzgerald earlier in their career uh, stayed here. And uh, we rehabbed it. Um, an old, old couple in their 90s came to the opening and said, it looked better the way we rehabbed it than it did when it was operating as a hotel, which was a great compliment. Next. This is the first of two projects we did just for veterans. Next. This project is in Playa Vista, where the owner had to do mark was a market rate project, except he had to do in second phase of this five, 6,000 unit project called Playa Vista neighborhood in LA, had to do affordable housing. And he wanted our project to look as good or better than the neighboring housing. And we were actually criticized for it looking too good. And that lobby picture in the lower right is the picture behind me on the Zoom camera. Next. This was a great challenge. I bought an old church from the 1920s and rehabbed it into housing. Next. That's the interior. We saved that. And that became the community room. Next. This is a project because of the projects that we bought and the quality way we rehabbed it, we were able to buy from a church, this building, 15th story, 283 units and rehab it. And the project wasn't uh, earthquake safe and didn't have fire sprinklers. It, it needed a lot of work. We paid 8 million for it and spent 35 million rehabbing it, which is incredible numbers. Next. This is a project we have under construction, partners with Actors Equity in Hollywood. And all of the tenants are gonna be in the, in, are gonna be actors or other artists. Next. So the last one I'm showing you is two years ago, we were selected by the VA to redevelop the VA campus, the largest VA campus in the country. And it has lots of vacant buildings and vacant land. And they selected us in partnership with two nonprofits. Next slide. And this is the first building on, and we've started construction on it. It's building 207 and it's on the campus and we're, it's been vacant 15 years and we're rehabbing it into 60 homeless units for senior veterans. And that's it. So let's go turn to the questions. Tom, that was great. Appreciate it. And, uh, it was great to get to um, have some time with you before the holidays to get to know you a little bit. So that was a good segue into um, into this evening's uh, in this evening's forum. Um, so I mean, affordable housing can be construed as a lot of different things. I mean, you went through Section Eight housing, a lot of house housing for seniors, um, and you you already talked a little bit about what drove you to get into affordable housing, especially with your career in HUD, um, but you know, when you deal with municipalities and especially the, the financing of affordable housing today, it's much different than it was before. Um, how much of that is a part of how you think about what and what you, what you can achieve within each municipality um, from a development construction perspective because of the, the need generally for some sort of subsidies, whether it's live tech credits from the feds or otherwise? Well, let me explain used to be they'd have programs for affordable housing the federal government and they'd be short-lived they'd follow a bell curve and they would work well and then a new administration come in and kill the program and that's what happened with previous programs and what reagan did section 8 was created under nixon carter continued it but reagan came in and didn't believe the government belonged in housing in 86 they created the federal tax credit program and that's in which the federal government allocates funds to all 50 states who create a state agency and they allocate what you use, LIHTC, Low Income Housing Tax Credit. And those funds are allocated to states and they then allocate it to nonprofit and for-profit. I call myself a limited profit developer because everything we do is limited by government agencies we deal with. Anyway, 
I decide on a project based on the political will and the funding that might be available. When I started, the only funding sources were the federal government. The only state early in the 70s that started doing anything was Massachusetts. Now every state is involved. Currently, uh, we can get funding depending on the availability from the city, the local city, from the county of Los Angeles or Orange County or Ventura surrounding counties and from the state and different and federal government. And you have to be able to figure out how to do that. And the project I showed in Playa Vista, the development group that gave us the land gave it to us for $1. So all we needed to combine to make the project work was federal tax credits. But I have a project, for example, in Calabasas, a wealthy suburb where a bunch of the Kardashians live, Bieber lived there. It's a gated, mostly gated community, the west end of LA, wealthy like Beverly Hills. And I did the one and only affordable housing project there. And I got a million dollars. I paid three million for the land. I got a million from the city, from their affordable housing trust fund. I got two and a half million from the county, from community development block grant money that LA County had from HUD. I got three and a half million from the state program. I got a million from the Federal Home Loan Bank. And then Chase became the lender and bought, oh, we got federal tax credits, but we didn't get the good kind. There's two kinds of tax credits. I don't want to bore you with all the details, but there's the nine and there's the four. It used to be you could get four anytime you wanted it. And the nine was competitive. The first year of the program in 87, California used one third of the tax credit. The second year, they used two thirds. The third year in March, for my Strathern Park project, they were all gone for the year. After that, every time you apply for them, it's an intense competition in California. And they tend to fund one out of three, one out of four projects. I currently have in Los Angeles City four projects that need funding to get built. They don't have a lawsuit. They don't have the neighbor opposition has been settled. We're ready to go, but we haven't put all the funding together. So the big change was that early Section 8 program. You'd go to HUD, they'd fund the whole project, and they back into the financing and they make a project work. And I had one attorney at a closing. Today, with all these sources of funding, I have seven, eight, nine attorneys at the closing for every institution, every entity involved. So if a city doesn't want the housing, even though the state says every city should do it, we go where we're wanted, where the city will embrace us and support us. And it's a political, I know the local political situation. I've been here in LA for 50, 50 and a half years. I moved here in October of 70. So I really know the communities and that makes a difference of where we go. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, in, in the challenge I imagine is, you know, there's a kind of a dearth of two different things. There's a dearth of the right to try to capital, the right kind of capital to build what you want to build. And there's also a dearth of housing, which is becomes a circular reference because you know, I, you know, what I think you'll probably see a lot of, especially in Los Angeles, is, you know, how can the demands of, of affordable um, housing needs, whether it's families, seniors, singles, first responders, how, how can they get met with the varying regulatory challenges, not just to, ma not just to mention the, um, you know, the lack of the, the right type of capital for it? Well, there is capital for for tax credit. We don't have any problem selling when we get tax credit, like we started on five projects in November, December, and each one got state, uh, two of them got 9% tax credit, three got four, but the state also gave a state tax credit 
to try to make up that gap. Because as I said, you need free land. And that's why the projects most competitive are where the city or the county puts the land up for zero or a dollar because of some tax reasons. And we're currently building a project in West LA, an upscale neighborhood that the city selected us on in a competition. It was the West LA Animal Shelter and they just, the councilman decided to make it available. It was closed, it had moved, made it available for housing. On a parking lot in the heart of Hollywood, we're doing our Actors Project, that project with Actors Equity. It was a surface parking lot and we are taking out the parking lot, replace it with below level parking and we're building housing above. And that's how the city has dealt with two properties that we're involved with. And in both cases, we're getting the land for zero. The veterans property, the VA selected us, but gave us no funding. We're getting the old buildings that we have to preserve and redo and the land we can build on for zero. But they didn't give us the funding. They didn't give us the financing. If you gave me a free building, if, if I had land and I built a building on it or somebody else built the building and you gave it to me to operate here locally, we need about five fifty six hundred dollars $600 minimum a month just to operate it, to maintain it, pay the common area utilities and the garbage and uh, the manager, the maintenance person. We, we get property tax waivers in California if you partner with a nonprofit which is what we're now doing. When I started, I didn't do that. I paid full property taxes. Now we're not because that's one of the ways that in California they're helping facilitate affordable housing. So we pay maybe 10% of the normal taxes in order to make the projects work. Now that's, that's interesting. Um, and I think maybe it would be helpful just to put in perspective for, um, for a lot of the folks on the call is you know, kind of how does it, how is affordable housing defined? So if you were to look at the varying percentages of, of average median income and then working down into that and really what you're talking about of what people can pay or can't pay for housing and, and how important some of those subsidies are. Um, I think going into some of that, that math would be a little bit helpful for people to understand really where the limitations of some people's incomes are. And then also, how much is gap, is really stop gapped when people are at 60% of average mean income can only pay maybe a thousand dollars a month in total housing cost? I think that'd be helpful for people to understand a little bit about how that works. For whatever reasons, when they created the tax credit program, they put the I wasn't there, but I was there when they created the Section 8 program. <laughs> I actually was in the room when they negotiated that in 74. The Section 8 program was created in Section in 74, and it was the first housing legislation Jerry Ford signed after Nixon left office. And that's at 50% of median income. When they created the program, it was at 80% of median. The tax credit program is at 60. They've now modified the Section 8 that you can do an income averaging of six, you can go up to 80% as long as the average is below 60. How to confuse you. But in Los Angeles County, about 37,000 for one person, 40,000 for two is 60%. Go about 10% less for 50%. That's the mat, ma maximum income. And when we created that project in Playa Vista, the market rate units built next door to us for renting, the one bedroom started it for a 550, 600 square foot one bedroom, rented for $3,000. And our units rented for 550 to 950. The problem with 550 to 950 is that's too high for really poor people. They need Section 8. The beauty of Section 8 rent subsidies, which still exist, 
They canceled it for, Reagan canceled it for new construction and substantial rehabilitation. But the funding still exists to go to housing authorities who allocated to people or buildings, like a voucher. And it also exists for the VA. All of our units at the VA that we're building have these vouchers equivalent to Section 8. So residents will move in there, pay 30% of their income. We will have people moving in, paying $50, $100 a month. That is the only way you get them off the street, truly. And so the building I built called Delray Square in West LA about five, six years ago, that was 25% homeless. We were partners with the Housing Authority of LA City, and that's how we had the vouchers. So we were able to take people, homeless people, into that building. If I have an ideal, it would be not doing a building more than 25% homeless, because a whole building of homeless is, is a challenge for management beyond belief. So, uh, but funding in California and particularly LA right now, they're trying to, we have an incredible homeless problem and they are trying to give funding to projects that are 50% or more homeless, even though a lot of owner operators don't wanna do that because they know better because to have, fill up a building with challenging residents who need hand-holding and medicine you know, assistance is, is really cha is beyond challenging. Um, and it, it, you sort of mentioned it, but, you know, on the, on the other hand is that, you know, most new projects, new development, if you do have market rate housing, they usually come along with some affordable housing requirements, depending on the size. But the, the, the cities generally sort of approach it, well, you have to meet a housing, uh, affordable housing requirement without some other solution. So how do you think about, you know, the cities maybe looking at some of these things a little bit differently as new housing is needed regardless, especially in markets like Los Angeles and in a lot of other sort of um, still high growth, you know, tail, you know tailwind oriented um, destinations. Um, what other tools in their toolbox can they start to apply outside of just requirements to add affordable housing in lieu fees, things like that, um, do you think that are potentially available or how can the, the city start to help, you know, private public partnerships to help come to a better solution that's what, than what's been put forth? Because um, there's obviously a, a dearth of units that are, um, that are in the market and there's a lot more that are needed. Well, you mentioned that California has SB 1818, which means Senate Bill 1818, when it was passed about 10 years ago, it gives density bonuses to the property developer owner if they do a percentage of affordable housing. And that is a source of a lot of affordable housing in California. There have been efforts in California and LA City, for example, to require every building over a certain number. In the early 70s, almost 50 years ago, there were six votes in the mayor's support, but never eight. You needed eight votes in the city council and the mayor to require all buildings of 50 units or more to do 15% affordable housing. If you made it, if you believed in it, let's put it that way, if you believe that having housing is a right, these are arguments that we're having in this country. When I started HUD in 69, George Romney, Mitt Romney's father was the secretary of HUD, former governor of Michigan. He was my favorite, I worked under him. He was my favorite secretary of HUD. So even though I'm an ardent Democrat at this point, I started out a Republican. When I was at Trinity, I was a Republican. But um, the Republicans, so many of them don't believe this, which is there was a Kerner Commission report in 68. And the conclusion of the report based on the riots that we had after Martin Luther King in this country were 
that every American is entitled to a decent, safe, and sanitary home. George Romney and the Nixon administration funded affordable housing to the max more than any period since, if you check that out. And it didn't continue after that. Then they created Section 8. There was a lot of funding. And the first people to carry out the Section 8 program was Carla Hills, the Secretary of HUD under Ford. And then Carter continued until Reagan continued it. But it needs a commitment of our country to that effect. And we see the conflict with medical health, Medicare, that there isn't that effort on both sides of the aisle to give people both medical help and housing. I happen to believe that human being in America, our rich country should figure out a way to do that. But it takes a lot of funding and it takes a real commitment to do that. And the result is in LA, I live in the wealthy area of Brentwood. We have tents and homeless people living within blocks of my house. And it's all over LA and particularly in Los Angeles City. So. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge, especially now um, in, a, in a significant recession, um, depending on what sector you, you live in or you, you work in rather. Um, how do you see you know, the, the housing crisis getting worse and potentially not much better um, outside of unemployment? Um, but you know, there are a, a lot of folks that if they couldn't afford a home before, they definitely can't afford one now, whether rent or for sale or otherwise. Um, how do you see the COVID situation um, impacting you know, what you're doing in LA? I know what I see throughout the country. Um, it's a tale of two cities, quite frankly. Um, but you know, how do you see some of these um, situational um, circumstances potentially getting worse? And, and, and what are some solutions other than what we kind of talked about already, just given the nature of the pandemic? It's a real challenge. I want to say that there was no commitment to deal with any of this on a federal level for the last four years. I'll give my little comment. There was only one secretary who served all eight years of Reagan's administration, and that was the secretary of HUD, Sam Pierce. And he had one job, the same job that the secretary of HUD, Ben Carson, just had for four years, and that was to be the black representative of the cabinet. Just call it what it is. So there was no commitment on that administration. That was not true with the Bushes before. And Reagan allowed the tax credit program to go through. Uh, this administration didn't want to do anything. We don't yet know what will happen on a federal level because we haven't seen what will happen with the Senate. Will enough Republicans participate? Personally, it doesn't look particularly promising. So what's happened in California, they won't get rid of the tax credit program. It's too popular for banks buy the tax credits. There's enough Republicans and Democrats behind this. But in the state of California, you're absolutely right. The city of LA is in deep doo-doo. You know, they are have enormous deficit. California, our governor has supported funding. When he came into office, I think his number one charge was homelessness. And then he got wildfire fires and has had nothing but grief since. But the state is committed to it. When I moved to California, there were four Republicans and one Democrat of the county supervisors. And there were four or five members of the LA City Council in support of affordable housing. Now there's 14 out of 15 Democrats and four, uh, all five, it was all male on the county supervisors, five females, one Republican, four Democrats. They all support affordable housing. And it's a 14 out of 15 vote in the city. So, and I see it in wealthy suburbs. Beverly Hills is looking at, I did, and worked on the very first and only affordable housing project in Beverly Hills, working with a nonprofit. We created 150 units of low-income housing. So on a federal level, 
It's too soon to tell. We don't know. But we definitely have an administration who is more committed to it. On a state and local level, it's going to be, it's going to vary dramatically throughout the country and from city to city. And it really takes everyone on this, you know, call today and, every, and all of us around the country to want to make a difference and to realize what country do we have if we don't take care of the poor people. I just saw a question about opportunity zones. My Hollywood project is in an opportunity zone. Opportunity zones work if you're looking, if, if it's about money. I build for the long term and don't sell. And I just built a Frank Gehry design small office building in Brentwood, a block from my house. And I paid for it with equity from four low income projects I built in the early 1980s. And that refinancing them. When I built them, I got special HUD financing, 40 years, seven and a half percent interest. But I was able to refinance and doing some rehab to them with three and a quarter, two and 2.9. I didn't believe in my lifetime I'd ever see financing like this. So that helped dramatically. So That's right. opportunity zones are for people who want to own property for the short term. It doesn't really apply to me because I'm looking at the long term. There, if you sell it in a, a short period of time, less than 10 years or 10 years, you don't pay income taxes on it. So I don't, I haven't seen quite yet how it helps it, how it's helped develop, uh, you know, areas that need help. Uh, I haven't quite seen that effect. Um, have you might be able to answer that. it's I, it's been a very difficult thing to scale and it's um I think it's been very situational um, at least in my experiences with it um it's it's been a into your point it is very much geared towards um, a more efficient sort of uh, investor that wants to get additional value out of um, kind of kicking the can on capital gains. And, and it, it has pushed capital into places that it may not otherwise have gone. But I, I don't think it's scalable enough and is effective enough um, to, I think, really make an impact um, overall uh, that's, that, that's needed, especially as it pertains to, um, you know, doing affordable housing at scale. Um, it's a hard thing to do, especially as, you know, it's really so municipal dependent on, on what can work. But that's been my experiences with it thus far. So, um, so Tom, let's let's pretend you're you're 22 years old and you're you're uh, it's it's to the, to the, uh, 2021 and you're a Trinity alum that's young or you're coming out of college. Um, you know, what would you sort of suggest to some folks that are on the line today in terms of how to think about your your, your particular career or how you know if you were starting over what you'd do the same, do differently, or, you know, what do you think the world looks like now versus when you started? I mean, we've, we've gone through a little bit of it um, just now, but I think it'd be great to kind of get your perspective on and thoughts and advice for those that are, are just on the front end of their career. Great question. And I have, I'm, I, you gave me that question, or I was given that question in advance. And I thought of the people who work in our office and who are successful and who are not, and what their background is. The MBA helps a lot. There's a master's at several schools that have masters of real estate development. And two of my uh, key people in my office have uh, MBA from USC and a master's in real estate development. So they understand finance. One of our former employees went for a master in planning. And I said, planning is done by the council people, basically. It's done by the elected officials. Very, very few cities do uh, planning in a good way. They're done politically. In LA City, we have a weak mayor, strong council. And so each 15 council members do the planning in their district. 
I don't even know. We have six projects ongoing in LA City. I don't even know the name of the planning director in LA City currently, but I know the names of all 15 council members and the mayor. The people who succeed, I was a 60s guy. I graduated in 67. We wanted to change the world. The only subject in our head when I graduated was what are we gonna do about Vietnam? Fortunately, I say this in retrospect, I applied for the Navy Officer Candidate School, but I had a football injury and I was excluded and it allowed me to travel. And so one of the things I recommend, there is nothing like traveling and seeing the world and exposing. I got inspired about, I didn't know, my father was a scrap metal. I didn't know how to get into development. I didn't know about it. And uh, I was working, I was going to school and one of my professors was on the housing authority of Chicago in 69. And he got me an interview at HUD and that's how I ended up at HUD. And then I stayed at HUD because I liked it better than school. And I worked with developers. I worked with housing authorities and nonprofits and developers for profit doing HUD type housing. And I, uh, I got inspired by it. I read The Fountainhead. So I recommend this book, Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead. And the conclusion of that book for me, two books that most influenced me, her book, because I concluded it's a protagonist as an architect. And I concluded be a developer, not an architect. Developers are in charge. Secondly, I read Jane Jacobs' book on the rise and fall of great American cities. And I was inspired by her caring about communities in American city and what makes successful cities. So the more exposure you have to a community in a world, you know, an understanding of communities and are turned on by it. So going back to be the 60s guy, I wanted to change the world. I've learned I'm not going to change. I didn't change the world, but I changed my corner of the world. And every time I do a project, I influence and impact that neighborhood and actually improve it with my affordable housing project. Now, that's, um, there's a lot There's a lot there. I know it's, um, I mean, even I'm thinking back to, you know, when I graduated, the, the world's changed in a lot of ways and a lot of other ways it hasn't. So, um, it, it's kind of about the ride, that's for sure. Um, so, so when you're hiring, um, when you're hiring people, um, what, what's the number one thing you're looking for, especially for young folks that, you know, may not have experience yet? It's a, it's a difficult business to kind of get into. You sort of have to find your way. At least that was my experience, um, and then inevitably uh, just build a resume. Um, but what, what are you looking for in terms of, you know, core tenets of someone's character and or um, sort of you know, raw experience and then inevitably how to mature that into uh, you know, kind of a longer term career? It's the char character, smarts, personality. Do we wanna have lunch with them? You can't, we learned that for our managers and our maintenance people. We were having trouble and I pushed my son, when he took over management, now he's president of the company. But when we, he started 20 years ago, we looked for personality and smarts. You can teach a property manager the skills, but you can't teach them character, personality, you know, warmth. I learned that the ma maintenance people, if they walk around a building and say, good morning, good afternoon, Mrs. Jones, then Mrs. Jones is comfortable having that person come in their apartment and fix something. And that makes the world of a difference. Further, the better we treat our maintenance and our management people, the better they will treat our residents. We normally, during this pandemic, it's another thing. Normally we have 0% vacancy collection loss. In the one-tenth, the two percent, two of 1% for across our portfolio and 5% is market rate. So it's not being too greedy and treating people well. 
And a lot of firms I've been talked into, just take me on as an intern. I'll show you what I can do. How have we brought on people who didn't have a background? If they pass that test, I want to say in LA, you know, I also push my staff to have employees and office people, our, our associates who reflect our, our greater community. In other words, I'm in West LA. That's a, this, I get in trouble. I could hear my, my, uh, one of several people in my office stamping on my foot in an interview, but we need to hire people who represent the rainbow of LA and not just white males, you know? And so that, you know, you're helped. I believe in this field, particularly given the character and nature of the field, you'd be helped if you're a woman and you're a minority. And there's some, you know, white males I would like to hire, but I've told my staff, you gotta, can't keep hiring white males. So that's very blunt, but true, true statement. I know that's true in New York and elsewhere. Yeah. Um, there, was a, there was a question that came up, which I, I, is interesting. Um, and we've, we've had to look at this and have looked at it as well about, you know, affordable for sale housing. I know that's not, not your, um, not your bailiwick per se, because that's a, not a long-term ownership sort of proposition, but, um, affordable for sale housing does have, uh, you know, some nuances to it. Is that anything you'd ever looked at or considered or potentially, um, you know, done as a part of, you know, a, an overall affordable rental program? Yes, I worked on that at HUD. We sold foreclosed properties, 25 units, 25 houses in packages, and each house went for about $10,000. Oh, my and this was in like 73, 74. I did my first condo project and I opened up in 81 and they were lower price condos. And we built it in a nice community next door to a affordable senior project we did. And we opened up in 81. Does anyone out there know what the interest rate? My construction- 19, Was that 18%, 19% maybe? Yeah, <laughs> my construction rate, fixed. They gave a special rate at 17%. And my permanent interest was 15%. After having that experience, I said, I'm not doing it. Because when you start a project, the market, by the time you finish it, you know, you can open and everything can be wonderful. But you can also open in a downturn and not be able to sell any unit. And I love having Mrs. Jones come up to me, give me a hug and cry and never dreamed I could have a home like this in my life. And that feeds my soul. And I haven't gone into this to hit home runs. I read the books about Zeckendorf and people who are former president, people who go for home runs and I'm comfortable hitting a single and a double. And actually once in a while we had home runs. That Santa Ana building that you saw that I got $2,500 for the consulting, I paid 12 million for it about 23 years ago. We just refinanced it at $60 million value. So you can figure out that math. And I shared 50% with my employees. So I made some people in my office very, I took really good care of them. So- Yep. That, that's fantastic. And um, I mean, that's also the power of inflation. <laughs> I don't know. So. No, absolutely. And my part yeah. was the very first project I did urged me to hold on to the buildings because over time, we they said we regretted every building we sold. If you have a good neighborhood, if you have a good project, hold on, figure out a way, refinance it, and it's going to put you in a wonderful position. So I never did the housing for a short-term gain. Everything was for the long-term. And one of the questions on the list that you gave me before, why are you so committed? The picture behind me is the lobby of the low-income senior building in Playa Vista. Next door, people paid a million plus for condos or on the other side of the building, 3,000 and up for an apartment. That 
That's real good. I put good art in my buildings. We landscape it beautifully. I happen to think our building's more attractive than our competition. And I do that because from the beginning, I was committed to build a building that I would be comfortable putting my family in, or if it was a senior building, my parents in. Now I'm the senior, you know, now I could qualify. <laughs> Fortunately for the income level. <laughs> Well, that's great. Well, Tom, I think it's about uh, it's about time, but um, it's been great to get to know you over the last couple of months as we prepared for this, and um, appreciate you sharing your your career, which has been really impressive. And um, it's it's obvious that you can do both. You can do a lot of good and and still be successful. So these things aren't aren't uh, they don't have to be um, bifurcated. They could be done together. That's for sure. There was a question that flashed across the screen about mentoring kids and the answer is yes, um, we can do it online. And my email is tom at tsahousing.com. And I just got a, I see a text from Ray Graves, hello to you. He was a classmate, <laughs> I haven't seen you since we graduated. So hello, <laughs> Ray Graves. That's fantastic. So, so Tom at TSAhousing.com, the school will make it available. And uh, I just encourage everybody online. I had a lot of mentors. I didn't have a clue how to get into this field. And everybody, you know, all these different people helped me along the way. And I think that's part of what this type of housing is about. People who believe in giving back and making a difference. And, the way this world works, if all of us care about each other and give back and support our community. And here's the last story to end on. We had a homeless person living in a car, usually a block from my house. And one day, and he sold poems, but one day we stopped and we talked to him. And I had watched the L an LA Times columnist who had met a Juilliard graduate, play the violin on the streets in downtown LA, and he befriended him and helped him. Well, we stopped and talked to him for a couple hours, my son and I, and we found out his story. And over the next two months, we got him to move into one of our buildings. He spent the last five years of his life in assisted living in one of our buildings. So all of us can make that difference and it's, you know, participate in the community in the neighborhood and, and literally talk to talk to our neighbors and talk to the homeless person. That's right. Well, thanks again, Tom. Thanks, Caitlin, for putting this together. And thanks, Steve. And, and thanks to all the Trinity alumni and current, um, uh, current student body who had the opportunity to join. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks. Take care, everyone.